Well, ladies and gentlemen, it sounds like I'm on. I hope you can all hear me. Um, and I just got back from the Nordics last night at about 7 o'clock, so I'm a little bleary-eyed, but uh, I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm thrilled that so many of you came out on a Thursday morning to uh, see the beautiful swan and hear Her Excellency, the Ambassador of Denmark to the United States, say a few words about, um, about Denmark and about the artists and about the artwork and about repurposing things that... Uh, Creating beauty out of garbage, I guess, is one way of looking at it. But uh, we're honored to have the swan here, and we're honored to have the support of the Danish Foreign Ministry and the Ministry of Culture. And Scan Design, of course, was also very um, helpful in bringing the swan from Washington, D.C., where it had been on display at Kennedy Center and at the embassy. Um, so again, and it'll be here probably till the end of the year before it moves on to Elkhorn, Iowa. And then where from there, I'm not sure the Nordic Swan flies, but we'll, we'll be thrilled um, to be a part of it and to watch it. Um, and again, there's another project on the horizon from the same artist, Thomas Dombo, that you'll be hearing more about from the museum as that moves forward. But again, that's another exciting project that Scan Design and the museum are happy to partner with a number of others in seeing that move forward. With that said, um, I'd like to ask for a round of applause for the Danish Ambassador to the United States, Lona Visby, Her Excellency, Lona. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, Eric, um, it's a tremendous pleasure for me to um, be standing here today at the beautiful National Nordic Museum to celebrate the arrival of Nordic Swan uh, with you. Um, as it appears, uh, a giant sculpture constructed from more than uh, 300 uh, recycled plastic buckets uh, by the Danish artist uh, Thomas Dambu. Um, let me start by thanking you, uh, Eric, and curator Leslie Anderson, uh, together with uh, Fidelma Begin from Scan Design Foundation, uh, for giving us this opportunity uh, to display a piece of Danish art here uh, outside the Nordic Museum. I'm very pleased with the fruitful cooperation we've had uh, throughout the years. Um, there is a strong bond between Denmark and, uh, and Washington State. Um, four years ago, the Danish Crown Princess and the Minister for Foreign Affairs were here to launch a new cultural initiative um, for the U.S., anchored in, uh, in six cities throughout the US, uh, Seattle being one of them. Um, the focus of the initiative was to promote Danish uh, artists and further cultural exchange and enhance the already strong ties uh, between uh, our two countries. Um, and since the launch, we have seen Danish musicians and authors and artists uh, performing all over Seattle. Uh, Danish famous painters as L.A. Ring um, have been exhibited and the cooperation continues. You may ask yourself, uh, why bring a giant swan from Denmark all across uh, the Atlantic? Um, the answer is simple. Denmark, whose national bird is the swan, um, is a strong advocate for a more sustainable world, uh, also in the realm uh, of the arts. And many Danish artists, including uh, Thomas Dambo, uh, use their work to motivate and to promote action. Um, known for crafting large works out of uh, large works of art out of waste material, uh, Dambo sculptures show the potential in materials that are discarded and thus becoming a threat to nature. Dambo's work celebrates community by reclaiming trash and creating magical beings from it. He's particularly famous for his massive trolls. Uh, build a recycled wood, uh, which can be found in forests around the world uh, and various places here uh, in the U.S. We are living in a world where preserving the environment is an urgent concern for future life on the planet. Uh, we waste a lot of resources and hurt nature. We hurt the environment and the climate in the process. Our water sources are particularly at risk from waste materials and action must be taken uh, to save them. Nordic Swan is a testament uh, to sustainability and recycling and, and challenges the viewer to think of creative uh, ways to reuse waste materials. A worthwhile challenge, especially when it comes to plastic 
waste. I'm very happy that 175 nations, including Denmark um, and uh, the US in March, agreed to end plastic pollution, aiming to develop an international legally binding instrument by 2024. I'm also happy that Denmark has set ambitious domestic goals to make sure that reduce, reuse and recycle is more than a slogan and to reach a climate neutral waste sector by 2030. You probably all know of the Danish author uh, Hans Christian Andersen and the famous fairy tale, The Ugly Duckling. Um, a baby swan mistaking for a duckling uh, gets off to a rough start in life, uh, but ends up becoming a beautiful swan in the right environment. Take a look at Nordic Swan, um, and you could say the same. Waste materials that might not be recognized as potential resources turned into this beautiful creature. And here it stands as a symbol of the strong Danish commitment to mitigate, Danish, or to mitigate climate change and reduce plastic waste. Environmental issues can seem abstract and hard to grasp, um, but I think artists and art can sometimes help us, help us understand difficult subjects physically and emotionally, make us think and make us act. And they can thereby serve as an important uh, eye-opener promoting global uh, climate action. And global climate action is important. It's important for our current and future generations. Um, I'm therefore happy that Seattle, like Denmark, has set ambitious goals uh, for emission reduction. Uh, to reach these ambitious goals, uh, Denmark, together with partners, is working to mitigate impact on the climate in a wide range of sectors. And I want to just highlight three of these sectors, energy, water, and food production. For almost 50 years, we have invested heavily in the development and of clean and renewable energy, going all the way back to the early 1970s when the oil crisis, uh, crisis hit us. Denmark was at that time 90% dependent uh, on oil in our energy consumption, and the crisis had a huge impact on the Danish economy, most no notably exemplified by car-free Sundays. I remember those. <laughs> um, we have since come a long way, and today renewable energy uh, constitutes approximately 40% uh, of the total Danish energy consumption primarily uh, coming from biomass and wind energy. And we have achieved this by focusing on long-term planning of our energy system and ensuring broad political support to the green transition uh, the, so that change in government would not mean a change for renewable energy. And I think it's also important to uh, underline that not only has the green transition been good for the environment, but it has actually also been good for business. We have shown over the years that it's possible to decouple economic growth from greenhouse gas emissions. Um, from 1990 to 2019, Denmark's real GDP increased by 67%, while we cut greenhouse gas emissions by 37%. And we have actually also seen that in the green sector, uh, we have managed to produce five, four to five times the amount of growth and the number of jobs as in the general private sector. So it's a good business case. However, obviously 40% renewables in our energy system is not enough. So in 2020, the Danish parliament with broad uh, political support adopted the Climate Act, making a le legally binding commitment to reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 70% by 2030 compared to 1990 and becoming climate neutral by 2050. Climate ambitions um, that will require large investments in the future Danish energy systems. And to achieve our climate neutrality in 2050, we are focused on electrification of sectors as the primary driver, meaning putting heat pumps in homes, changing to electrical vehicles, etc. And to support this process, uh, we are now planning to build uh, the world's first artificial energy island, uh, to support the development of 600 offshore wind turbines to be placed in the North Sea. And once fully constructed, it will be the largest infrastructure investment in Danish history, approximately uh, $30 billion. In the water sector, people say 
if climate change is a shark, water is its teeth. Um, and global water sources face increasing pressure, not only from pollution, but also from incre increasing floods and droughts. I was in California and Santa Barbara yesterday. It was very obvious uh, what, uh, that the problem is also felt here in the US. Here at the museum, we are close to the sea. And Denmark, you're never further than 30 miles uh, from the sea. And we believe water is key to creating cities that are sustainable and attractive places to live in. We respond to increased risks from flooding by combining climate adaptation measures with exciting urban development, building multifunctional green and recreational spaces that increase our climate resiliency as well as our well-being. That's important. I'm trying to convince people that the, uh, the road to climate neutrality, neutrality is not a Via Dolorosa. It can be a very pleasant road. <laughs> All, our, all of our drinking water comes from groundwater in Denmark, which we carefully protect and manage sustainably. Um, we treat almost 100% of our wastewater, with the result that you can actually swim in the harbor of Copenhagen. The water sector is traditionally uh, energy intensive, but by now the Danish water sector has been on the path towards energy neutrality for some years. From our wastewater, we recover energy and resources that contribute to a green energy system and a circular economy. In 2019, the uh, wastewater treatment plants produced 70% of the energy they used, uh, with the most efficient ones actually being energy positive. And the water sector um, has committed to becoming climate uh, and energy neutral by 2030. Approximately 4% of the world's energy consumption is used on treating water. And with the rising energy costs that we see globally at the moment, uh, it is not only important for the environment to work towards net zero, it's also financially beneficial. A few words on our food security. Global food production faces uh, huge challenges over the coming years and decades. Um, the effects from our food production on climate change and biodiversity must be addressed, and we all need to do our part, both as individuals and as states. Um, the challenge of transforming our food and agriculture sector demands global solutions and cooperation. Last year, the Danish parliament approved a landmark agricultural agreement that sets up uh, binding targets for the agriculture and forestry sectors to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by between 55 and 65% by 2030 compared to 1990. Thus, a great step on the way to fulfill the commitment to reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 70%. It is the Danish government's hope that a small country like Denmark can use the expertise of our highly developed food production systems to contribute to the development of innovative solutions for the global food systems. It's crucial to focus on new technology and innovation if we want to achieve a green transition of the, uh, of the food systems. And therefore, we're also happy to support and take part in the Agriculture Innovation Mission for Climate, which the US launched at COP26 uh, in Glasgow. But we cannot reach the target for the climate uh, emission reduction alone. A good example is the cooperation we have with the state of California. Um, the aim is to develop and apply new climate-friendly solutions and exchange knowledge on best practices within the dairy production. It is our hope that these projects and others might be relevant at a federal level and that our bilateral cooperation can evolve in, in the future. And though our climate targets are important, uh, we are also very aware that we are a small country and we contribute with only 0.1 of global greenhouse gas emissions. And if we want to make real change uh, globally, we need to partner uh, with other countries and share our experiences and, uh, and know-how. Um, the United States is an important partner in these efforts, both globally and nationally. Globally, we work together on many initiatives, such as working towards making the shipping industry operate on zero emission fuels, uh, cut methane emissions at levels consistent with the Paris Accord, and rapid, rapid scaling of low carbon technologies in the hard to abate uh, carbon industries. We work closely with all levels here in the US, federal, 
state and cities. Um, we cooperate with the federal administration and four states to develop offshore wind and achieve President Biden's target of 30 gigawatts of uh, offshore wind by 2030. We have partnerships at the state and city levels with the uh, aim to further common learning to reduce electricity consumption in industry and buildings through energy uh, efficiency. We work together on making our water sectors more efficient and sustainable and also on making our cities more climate resilient. So that was a tour of the, uh, the Danish uh, ambitions on green transition that we happily share with, with, with you and cooperate with you on. So let me just conclude by thanking you uh, again for being here today. I hope that many people will stop by and see the Nordic uh, Swan and the museum in the months to come and also reflect upon how we can all contribute uh, to making uh, to creating a more sustainable world. Thank you very much for coming. I just uh, um, asked if the ambassador would take a few questions, and I, I'd love to start off with the first one. You're, uh, you're stepping down as ambassador to the U.S. What's uh, what's your future hold? What's next? Yeah. yeah. So it's um, that's right. My uh, my term is ending here, end of August, and it's always very hard to uh, to leave U.S. and D.C. because being ambassador to the U.S. and is the jewel in the crown uh, in Danish diplomacy. But I'm very happy that I've been given the opportunity to become ambassador to NATO. So I'll be moving to Brussels. Um, yeah, and uh, and to me, obviously, the in 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 the historic circumstances we are in, th this is very meaningful. I look forward to uh, continue my work uh, for my country and for all of us as allies uh, to uh, to make sure that we are we are uh, safe and protected from our, from the challenges that that face us. Um, Tuesday, I uh, sprinted down to State Department to deposit uh, the, uh, the Danish ratification instrument, saying we are ready for Sweden and Finland to, uh, uh, to become members of, of NATO. Uh, and I'm happy that, uh, happy that we could do, do that as one of the first countries, even though Canada tried to beat us, but, uh, they, but they didn't. <laughs> So, uh, so this is uh, super important, and I'm, I, I look very much forward to working uh, inside NATO with our Nordic bloc. I think we can offer, we have a lot to offer. I think we have a lot of uh, values uh, with, uh, with which we can uh, affect the, uh, the cooperation in NATO. So, um, so uh, I will definitely bring our close Nordic cooperation here in the U.S. onwards to, uh, to Brussels. Any, uh, yeah, please. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not uh, an expert, obviously, on these issues, but this is a cooperation that is taking place globally and also inside the United, United Nations to see how we can address this. So one thing is cleaning up the mess that we have already made, but another, I think, very important thing is to make sure that we don't make more more a mess and to make sure that uh, if we use plastic that it is recycled and maybe also to try to reduce the plastic that we actually use. So, so all these um, ambitions are, are dealt with in different um, fora and I think actually United Nations is a very central uh, organization to, uh, to do that. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, well, uh, thank you. I, I think um, 
it has become very clear, if you, if you weren't aware of it uh, already, it's become very clear that energy security is security policy. And, uh, and I think in the European Union, we have set a very, clo uh, very clear goal to become independent of, on oil and gas from, from Russia, uh, and also to look, have a close look at our supply chains. Um, and that doesn't go only for energy, but for resources more generally. We have to make sure that uh, our supply chains are resilient uh, and that we're not w all of a sudden facing a situation where we are dependent on adversaries for for our needs and and so I think that's uh, that's an important job that uh, that lies ahead of us it goes for energy uh, climate change definitely also security risk uh, we can see uh, a lot of conflict arising out of uh, you know uh, climate change so uh, so that's also a separate um, argument for addressing climate change we are very focused on um, developing countries uh, countries prone to conflict to see how we can uh, address their climate uh, change issues uh, we want to make sure that they have that they uh, that their countries develop in in a way that they can you know, survive and they can produce uh, the food uh, they need f in order to be able to uh, to survive. So, um, important questions, very direct link between climate, energy, and security. Uh, I would say, yeah, yeah. I was, uh, yes, one there. Well, like the others, I thank you for visiting. Or thank you for visiting us and. Since you have a strong background in, in security issues, I'm particularly interested in the effect of the war in Ukraine on food security, not just for Europe, but for the rest of the globe, mm. and wondered what actions you think should be taken to resolve that problem, especially with the Russians interdicting the transmission of grain supplies out through the Black Sea. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, so in the short term, we are working hard to find a way for Ukraine to, to simply get grain out of Ukraine. There are different uh, possibilities, but we're wor working hard to make that materialize. Um, we are also working with the countries uh, most affected by, uh, by, by the food crisis. Uh, we are all trying to see how we can increase our food production. I think it goes for the U.S. as well, and it goes for, for Denmark. Uh, and, and so um, a lot of initiatives have been taken. But I also fear personally that it, it will not be enough. I don't think that we will be able to avoid uh, the crisis. And so we have to look at how we can best uh, mitigate it. But definitely the short term, try to get as much grain out of Ukraine, um, in order to reduce uh, the risks that we are facing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. <laughs> Sure. Well, first of all, as I said, uh, we have seen much more job, m many more jobs created in the green sector than in the general private sector. But of course, it's important to create jobs for those who lose jobs in the black economy. I, we understand all in the black energy uh, sector. We understand that. Um, I'd, I'm not sure it would be more costly 
uh, to adapt uh, to change and to uh, transition into green economy. On the contrary, I think it would be more costly not to do it. Uh, so, uh, and actually, you, you know, the last, the latest offshore wind park that we announced in Denmark um, is without any subsidies. On the contrary, actually, the developer has to pay in order to, to build it. So, uh, so uh, we are, I mean, technolo technological development is also helping here. The, the technologies are maturing and they need less support. Uh, but I think where we have, um, the, the way we have gone about this is really by retraining the workforce. I think this is immensely important to make sure that those uh, who are out of job because of the transition will be retrained to take new jobs in the new economy. And this is a system we've had, I think, in the Nordic countries uh, for centuries or for, for decades, and we have, we have been developing that uh, constantly. One example is, uh, is the port of Esberg in, in Jutland. It used to be an old uh, fisheries port. Uh, at, some, at some point, um, we were outcompeted on the, on the, in the fishing industry, and, and um, we couldn't really uh, keep up uh, the level of, of fishery that we had. It transitioned into an oil and gas port because we uh, excavated oil and gas from the North Sea. Uh, now that we are uh, phasing out oil and gas, it is transitioning into an offshore wind port. Um, and, uh, and it's actually, this is the interesting part, it's the same workers that went from fishing to oil and gas and now to offshore wind. So I'm not saying you can do that everywhere and in, in every circumstance, but there's definitely a potential here, here and I think also in the US to look at how uh, you can tr retrain the workforce. And I know that a number of our companies also in offshore wind are doing that already in the US, uh, setting up academies uh, to train the workforce for, this, uh, for these new industries. So that would be my, um, that would be my suggestion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's a, there's a big job in incentivizing people to do the right thing. It has to, it has to be easy uh, and it has to feel good, right? So one thing is uh, waste, uh, what is it called, waste sorting or, yeah. So make sure that it's easy uh, to, you know, get rid of your w waste and, and put it in the right <laughs> pockets, basically, and make sure that those who collect them also um, distinguish uh, between the waste that you have now sorted. Uh, so, so those are examples uh, that you could do at the um, at the local level. I think it, the same goes for energy efficiency. Uh, I usually say that the best energy is the energy not spent, uh, and I think there's a huge potential also in the U.S. Uh, when you look at energy efficiency in buildings and in, in industries. Uh, remember to uh, turn off the light. <laughs> remember to uh, yeah to to uh, to do everything you can to reduce your electricity consumption. Maybe the aircon doesn't need to be in fifty degrees, right? Fahrenheit. I I don't know how you cope with that. I I, I spent three and a half years here. I'm not I'm not <laughs> I haven't got used to the U.S. aircon system, so that consumes a lot of energy. Uh, so there are things we can all do, and I think it's it's a good point to uh, to look at the local level and see what you can do there, and then it builds up from there. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, sure. We can we can make that work. I'm sure there are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, this is something that is a focus of, of ours, actually, uh, and, and SWAN is, is one example. We have others. I know that right now our minister, uh, Ministry of Culture uh, is drafting a new strategy, and so we are looking forward uh, to, to seeing what come out, comes out of that, but I'm, I'm quite confident that uh, sort of the whole fighting climate change, green transition will have a prominent place uh, in that, and that will also be something that we'll be working on uh, here in the U.S. with U.S. partners. Thank you very much for those uh, those kind remarks. Maybe that's a good. I think it's a perfect. <laughs> <laughs> to end, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Hi, I'm Leslie Anderson. I'm the director of collections, exhibitions, and programs here at the National Nordic Museum. And we want to thank Her Excellency Lona Denke Wiesbo um, for her talk. As she discussed, art has the power to raise our awareness and to urge action on critical issues that face us today. Recycle art activist Thomas Dombo transforms trash into treasure, creating public sculptures that both beautify their surroundings and affect change. The National Nordic Museum is pleased to welcome this important piece to the museum, um, situated in, the, in a place of heightened visibility for maximum effect. Dombo's engaging sculptures often depict the whimsical creatures that figure in Nordic folk tales. Um, and as Ambassador Wiesbo mentioned, um, it recalls the fairy tale of the ugly duckling penned by author and fellow, fellow Odense native Hans Christian Andersen. The titular character experiences both alienation and acceptance in its journey from Signet to Swan. Um, and as also noted, this is Denmark's national bird. The sculpture shows the country's commitment to sustainability. Moreover, the swan is an emblem of environmentally friendly products that is widely recogni recognizable to Nordic consumers today since it was introduced by the Nordic Council of Ministers as an eco-label in 1989. The museum wishes to thank the Embassy of Denmark in Washington, D.C., the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Denmark, and the Ministry of Culture in Denmark for the loan of the Nordic Swan, for bringing it to here to us in Seattle. Um, and additional support was, um, was thanks to the, um, the Scan Design Foundation supported its installation. Our reception and the conversation continues now. If you've not already, please do visit the Swan, um, which is located just outside the west entrance of the building. Or if you'd like more Danish art, um, please do go see paintings by Wilhelm Hemershoi and L.A. Reng in our current exhibition, From Dawn to Dusk, Nordic Art from Sweden's National Museum. This magnificent exhibition will return to Stockholm um, shortly after it closing on July 17th. Enjoy. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, we are recording this, so if you'd like to, uh, it'll be posted, I believe, on the website in a few days, so you can, uh, um, the comments would be appreciated, and we'll forward those on and make those available. But again, as Leslie mentioned, um, the reception continues. Um, we have the Ambassador here with us for another half an hour or so, so please, um, coffee and treats are out in the Fjord Hall. Enjoy the sculpture. Thanks to Scan Design. Thanks to Denmark for making this happen. Appreciate it all. Enjoy the rest of the day.